I, I uh, was promised to say a few words about the current conditions in the financial markets in Sweden as it's been a fairly uh, interesting summer uh, and we have not communicated so much around it from, from finance inspection. So let's say a few words about that. Uh, we have now high inflation, raising interest rates, and this of course have introduced big challenges in the commercial real estate sector. We have been warning around, around about that, and also for households and the, and the, and the uh, housing market. We have taken structural measures for both those parts of the economy, amortization requirements, higher capital requirements for lending and commercial real estate. And this, I think, all in all has dampened the buildup of risk and also made the Swedish system more resilient. So without those measures, we would have been worse off. We believe that a household could pay their mortgages even with raising interest rates. We have stress tested them and they will do fine in that sense. So the risk of large uh, credit losses in the banking sector due to the, the stress in the, uh, in, the, in the household sector I think is limited. Uh, but of course they need to do otherwise with their spending. So instead of spending on, uh, on interest rates payments, uh, uh, when they pay more for that, they have to pay less for others. And that could be a challenge for the Swedish economy. There is a little bit of a crossroads when it comes to commercial real estate market. Uh, interest rates have been rising uh, uh, sharply, both because of policy rates, but also risk premiums has gone up. Are we safe? Well, I think the jury is still out. Uh, the financing need from the commercial real estate sector will come later, so we have not really been tested. The bond financing has seemed to be very, very challenging. Uh, all those spreads have come down a little bit. We, we still see this as a risk. And then the commercial real estate sector need to turn to the banking sector. For many of the commercial real estate companies, that will be fine, but probably not for all. So in summary, the financial stability risk in the short and midterm term continue to be ele elevated, uh, but we think that the resilience is fairly good. And let me just say as a final remark on this subject that uh, this environment long term, I think actually is good for financial stability uh, as the hype and the the, uh, the, the extreme risk taking that we saw uh, during the zero uh, interest rate uh, environment was not uh, good for financial stability. So with that, I turn to the subject of, this, uh, of, of today's, uh, today's seminar. So let me just say a few words of the general kind of risks and opportunities when it comes to AI and automation, which is sometimes uh, kind of uh, mentioned in, uh, together. I think we need to have transparency around the models. Uh, it's extremely important for the outside world and the regulators and the clients to understand what's really going on. That's sometimes also called explainability. So you need to be able to explain. I think they lose a little bit to the, to the comments made uh, uh, earlier here that if you have a client, you need to be able to explain how your advice or how your model acted. And this is something also that to some, I think, uh, some extent I think is hindering the development because there is a risk here that if you don't have that, you will get complaints from clients, but also you might end up in, the, in a discussion with, uh, with regulators. So explainability is extremely important. This is something that also European regulators have thought of when they're do, uh, talking about the new AI Act. Data governance, of course, it's extremely uh, important. We sometimes say shit in, shit out. And so of course, that's extremely relevant in this case. ICT risks, uh, very relevant now as well. And not least, integrity issues. Uh, with the uh, more ambitious, I think, uh, 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 ideas and, uh, around integrity in Europe, maybe compared to some other parts of the world. So this will be kind of an extra European flavor to it that maybe is more relevant here and more pronounced here than in the US and other parts of the world. Uh, so for the individual institutions, the risk with adopting AI is pretty high. So what we see in the Swedish market where we talk uh, to market participants is that they use AI mostly in, let's say, low-risk areas, marketing, AML, 
a market abuse where the, uh, the, the, the positive outcomes are very high and the risk of negative outcomes are low. Uh, but we will, of course, will see other other uh, areas going forward. But what I worry about is that we, before we talk about you know the big pros and maybe cons with AI and automation, we also need to think about the general problem, problems that we see in the financial sector in general, not least when it comes to consumer finance. And I guess the the the, the most important word there is incentives. Incentive often pushes banks to sell, or advice as they call it, into expensive and complex products. Incentives also pushes banks to borrow as much as possible, and maybe not always in the best interest of the clients. We also know that there's a major gap between the knowledge of the household, the, uh, the retail, and the banks, and of course that's exploited by the banks if the incentives are not correct. Uh, and you could say that this is uh, maybe only theoretical, but it's not. Uh, what we see in our uh, supervision is that incentives is totally crucial. Let me say a few, uh, one, one or two examples. We found uh, institutions that sold credit instruments that were so complex, so it's actually extremely hard even for a fairly, fairly uh, uh, kind of well-educated financial uh, person to understand what the instrument is all about. A credit instrument where the, where, where the returns is dependent on the credit events and to an extremely high cost. And this is, they tried to fit into the, uh, the today's regulation. Of course, imagine if they kind of rigged the AI to sell the same kind of instruments. That would be, be turbocharged, something that is really bad for, for, for clients. And we see, of course, the same thing uh, when it comes to credits. And one of my, uh, one of my colleagues uh, tested the automate, automated advice model from one of the larger banks in Sweden. And one of the advice was, you know, maybe you need to have a little bit of cash set aside on a savings account. And of course, the obvious uh, answer if you go to a large bank is probably to look for a niche bank where the returns are better. But of course, the, the end result of that a journey was that they should actually shift money from the uh, from the uh, small bank into the savings accounts with this big bank. Again, incentives uh, uh, plays plays a large role here. So, uh, AI and automation uh, is important uh, and will play a big role. But you need to fix the incentives first. Uh, we see a, some growth of robo advice in the Swedish market. I think you typically think that, I think that's very, very welcome because the robo advice, some of the firms anyway, are actually providing independent advice. So you pay a certain fee every month or every year and then you get an advice from a robot. I think that's typically how robot devices also are working outside Sweden. And, and the typical advice is for, for index funds, uh, funds and that's what typically academics and for that matter supervisors are advising clients to do. Go for the low cost uh, funds when you're, when you're saving, uh, anyway, the largest part of your savings. Uh, and, and, and this is a possibility then to have a growth of independent advice to the uh, kind of larger, uh, larger number of households. What worries me a little bit uh, listening to your speech is that your clients were extremely wealthy, right? So sometimes and what we have been talking about that this is the possibility to get a kind of close the advice gap. So get advice out to lower income households, uh, advice that is based on, 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 on solid, let's say, theory and practice. Uh, but if you need to have something to hold, somebody to hold your hand because you, you know, you're biased, you're scared, uh, behavioral issues, well then maybe that argument is, uh, or that, that, uh, that uh, possibility is, 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 is not so kind of strong as I thought, but I still have a hope that it's, it's for sure better than to have uh, personal advice that is strongly biased through wrong incentives. Uh, 
And as I understand, what you see from research when it comes to robot advice, I think that sometimes is in some way alluded to also by, by previous speakers, that you get a better diversification, you don't sell so aggressively in downturns, uh, and you're less inclined to follow hypes tech hypes or biotech hypes or whatever it could be. So uh, that is, of course, would be a very, very uh, good thing. When it comes to credit assessment, I think it's also another thing that it's good, you could have less uh, of biases. Biases when it comes to race, bias, biases maybe to gender, biases where you live. So if you, you lend to somebody that lives in a nice area, you might be biased to lend more to that one and to, and to, to, to somebody that, that, that lives in a, in a, in a less uh, kind of uh, rich place. Uh, uh, and, and that is, of course, is a good thing. And also the, the, the race, uh, race uh, less race biased, if, if there is any, any of that kind, of which um, I'm sure it is. So, so I think credit assessment also could be a benefit from this. Uh, so, wh how, how, about, how about regulation and supervision when it comes to AI? This will be, of course, a big challenge. Uh, and I think that's a challenge for the industry as well, but to find the right personnel to do this, to find the right way to do it, because the risk is that we get, let's say, too formal. So we say, you're not following the rules that were set up, and that's, they are typically, of course, set up to, to deal with a non-AI world. And maybe that will hinder innovation, but also hinder development that would favor uh, something that we are, 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 are uh, in favor of, of course, you know, strong consumer protection and to handle financial stability. So this will be a balancing act to, let's say, be pragmatic enough to understand where AI and automatization is actually doing something well, something good, but also strict enough to say, well, now this is actually increasing risks. Uh, but the good thing maybe for us uh, is that development actually was also alluded to by, by uh, in, in previous speeches, it's pretty slow. Sweden are f f far, uh, far ahead when it comes to fintech, but it doesn't seem that we're far ahead when it comes to AI. Uh, and, and maybe that's a good thing, that we actually think through what we're doing, both the industry and the regulators. So, could we do something more from a regulatory point of view, and what are we doing? We are taking some first baby steps internally. We're trying to, for example, understand the concentration risk in the derivatives markets. Uh, of course, to some extent inspired by the Arcadius uh, uh, catastrophe. Uh, we are using automation or maybe, uh, let's say, more advanced methods using data to uh, understand more about market manipulation. Uh, and we also do a little bit of text analyzing of uh, applications and, and, uh, and uh, uh, advice material from banks and other institutions to try to find out whether they're following the rules or not. And of course, as was mentioned, AML. Uh, we see that banks are using uh, AI more when it comes to AML detection, and also we are trying to uh, go down that route. So, a lot of risk. Regulators typically talk about all the risks, but it's also, I think, a lot of opportunities. We should not forget where we are, and we are in a world where a device, and I actually prefer to say uh, selling of uh, financial instruments is strongly biased, strongly influenced by incentives, and typically uh, mostly done to uh, rich private individuals. If this could change, be more neutral, more the theoretically based, and more to the broad public, that of course is a very, very good thing. And if we succeed with that, maybe the financial industry will do better in its main purpose, namely to lend, to save, and to pay. And uh, last but not least, uh, I'm inspired by what was mentioned about ESG, because as, as was said here, the ESG ratings and to understand what is ESG or not, I think is a major challenge for all of us, because this is a big hype. And if we don't act uh, correctly here, the risk is there's a big backlash when people understand that they were basically fooled uh, and it was not ESG, it was only selling. So if we could use AI in a good way to handle that uh, problem, of course, that would be extremely good.
I know, Taron, that you have this paper on uh, machine learning in the, in the credit market, so what would your uh, response be? What were your findings from that study first? Sure. Um, so this is also work with uh, Ansgar Walter, who's, who's back over there. He's the, the guy who, he's the, actually a robot. <laughs> 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 who's very good at producing papers. Um, uh, so he's the brains behind the operation. Um, but the, um, the, the work uh, that we did, and I, I wish I had had that video because it's fantastic. It really does sort of uh, reveal something that I think is, is very interesting. Um, so just to give you a very brief summary, our, 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 basically we started with this idea that if you throw uh, machine learning into credit screening, um, you know, is it good for everybody? And the answer is it, it might not be. Um, and in particular, it might not be for two different reasons. One is um, we think of credit provision as being anonymous based on a set of characteristics uh, that we all have. But if certain groups uh, in society have very particular characteristics, then you might de-anonymize them by bringing automation into the equation. So that's the first thing, which is what we call triangulation. We can try to figure out who you are by, by doing this. It turns out that actually this was uh, first, you know, this idea of triangulation was discovered during, they put some Netflix data out there uh, to sort of see if they could create recommendation engines. And then enterprising researchers very quickly merged that Netflix data with IMDB ratings. And pretty soon they could tell who was watching the naughty movies. Not so good. You might imagine that people were very uncomfortable about this. They got de-anonymized instantly, and so there's this triangulation that went on. But the other possibility is actually maybe technology that we've had right now, poor technology, has been kind of shielding people, which is it just pushes everybody to the average. But then as you start moving into more sophisticated technology, uh, what it does is it more accurately maps who's a good credit risk and who's a bad credit risk. And if you do that, then it kind of exposes pre-existing weaknesses in society. So some people may not be as capable of paying. Under the old system, you never had the technology to figure out who was good at paying and who was not good at paying. And if you are very good at figuring that stuff out, then you can maybe just shine a magnifying glass or, or put them on, onto people. And then, you know, you, you kind of get some pretty poor outcomes. So, you know, what you saw there, of course, is African Americans in the U.S. are very used to, you know, if you walk out of a store without paying for something, you know, you might be really terrified about what's, what's coming down the pipes. Um, and you might be more worried uh, that people are going to be able to, to sort of identify uh, some things about you that you're not very comfortable about. But uh, let, me, let me just open this up, of course, and I want to hear what all of you have to say. No, I, I think, you know, what we have seen in, in our, our supervision is that, you know, the risk of over-indebtedness is very high. And I ba basically, uh, you know, the... So the risk with this kind of, of uh, kind of uh, features is that uh, people are very find it very hard to say no. You know, if they get an opportunity, they will take it. Mm. So here you go to consumer protection and to sell something that is the best interest of the client. And how do you bring that into the model? It's one thing to say, you know, the credit risk, but even if the credit risk is there, let's say, is fairly small. Yeah. Is it advisable to add an extra two or three or four thousand credit to to a person to have a very very low income? The credit risk is low, but it's probably not good for the client to, you know, bear more and more uh, more in, uh, debt in in its in, in his or her balance sheet. So I see a risk of you know the speed yeah. uh, with, with automation and AI, and maybe we need exactly the other way around. We need less speed. Mm -hmm a more kind of think through your situation kind of discussion. Uh, you know, having said that, of course, maybe that could be built in, but, but there is a risk of this kind of speed and also, also a very strong focus on credit risk. And, and maybe there is a difference here also between US and Sweden as we, you know, the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, if households get into bankruptcy, that's a lifetime uh, sentence basically yeah. because you, you you basically have to pay your debt for a very very long time whereas I think that's to some extent yeah. dif is different in the US so so the consequences of over indebtedness is uh, is very very high but but just to add to that I think models can and, and have to be designed to find those limits because the way we now can build the recommender systems and um, the way we can 
see exactly when a customer starts to hesitate in the decision and also through measuring emotions actually understand when they are at a weak point of any kind, being nervous, being afraid, being hmm. eager to finalize a purchase. They're in a very sensitive state of mind. Hmm. And then when you have distributor who would sell financial services, who might not even be financial institutions, who are mostly interested in finalizing the purchase, you, you get into a very, hmm. very yeah. delicate situation where, where that kind of design in the models will be crucial, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really interesting conversation because it seems like, you know, we really like credit that allows people to get out of trouble, but we don't like credit that gets people into trouble, is what you're saying, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's right, which is that behaviorally speaking, I mean, I think some kinds of credit are good, allowing you to borrow from your salary uh, a little bit so that you have the capacity to repay versus encouraging impulse purchases. So if, for example, you're out there and you see this pair of shoes that you really don't need, and then someone, Klarna comes, or whatever, I mean, I don't need to, I mean, I don't need to name, gosh, I'm sorry about that. You know, I, at least I said it, right? The head of the Swedish supervisory authority didn't say that. But someone comes along and says, look, you know, here you are, you have some credit immediately, and you can buy this regardless of your budget constraint. Then it starts to become a, a, an issue, uh, hmm. right? And so... How do we find those limits? Well, a very yeah. large portion of credits, the smaller credits, actually go into gaming. Oh, yeah. So, you but know, then it's freedom of choice, you could say you should be able to borrow for it, but of course, it, it's a lot of risk with that, that kind yeah. of borrowing, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it, I guess that's, those are the limits that would be so hard, because if we're looking, for example, into the grocery market, and especially now with rising prices, we can see that with good data, we can identify loyal customers, and by the, the sort of the last 10 days of the month, when they will be hard for some families to pay for food, mm -hmm. you can give them a credit that is okay. sort of... Yeah. <laughs> you know, on a, on a retention mm. basis, yeah. because that yeah. is the data you sit on top mm. of. Mm. So, so there will be so very different use cases, and who will be the, yeah. no, wh where would you draw the limit for you, you, what's available and not? Yeah. Absolutely right. I mean, if it helps you to consumption smooth um, mm -hmm. and borrow against your future mm -hmm. income, or th then it's obviously great. But uh, your, your point about gaming uh, brought, brought home something, which is, my son, for some reason, at some stage, got interested in Minecraft. And then, you know, we were sort of just uh, sitting around, and then he comes over and he says, Oh, look, I got 45 skins or whatever it is. What? How, how did you do that? Oh, we were just, you know, mom left the computer open. 200 pounds on skins. <laughs> how the hell did you do that? How did that happen? And it turns out that there were, he just pressed a few buttons, and then, you know, and we were luckily able to reverse the transaction because, you know, and then, you know. Um, he faced some consequences, the negative consequences <laughs> of uh, AI on children. <laughs> but, but exactly that kind of, of warning signals could be built into any credit yeah. card system, both for gambling, exactly. for spending too much at sales, or even yeah. when you're out late night drinking and you, yeah. you, know, you buy your Absolutely. sort of 10th drink. <laughs> <laughs> but it could be done. I mean, yeah. technically, it's quite easy. Then it's rather a matter of like trust, like would yeah. you really like your, your credit card provider or bank to sort of give you exactly. a pointing finger when you spend too much in that area? So, so it's quite delicate in the trust sense. So. Yeah. But another area here, maybe you should um, have the moderator to, to question, but I think <laughs> the, the whole governance of the systems, both when it comes to robot advice, but also when it comes to these kind of credit models, you know, how do you govern them? Uh, and I, I made this analogy uh, uh, internally that when I talk to banks about their capital requirements, I say, well, you need to understand your internal models, the quant guys. Otherwise, you don't have a clue what kind of capital you have. Yeah. And of course, they agree, right? But it's still, it's, I think, sometimes very hard to understand kind of the input in the quant models that actually decides what kind of capital you have vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, a commercial real estate. Yeah. And the same goes here. If you don't understand the kind of the exactly. big picture of what the models are doing, well, then the governance issue, who is responsible? Is it yeah. the quant guy or is it the CEO, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we're already past that point. It's, it's yeah. the quant guy, right? But, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we'll still have some yeah. possibility to have you know, responsibility taken at mm -hmm. the very, very top in, in the, kind of in the organization. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Um, could I just say one thing about that, which is, I think one thing that's also helpful uh, to kind of distinguish is that, you know, Sweden and, Scan and Scandinavian countries more generally are high trust societies. So if it is the case that you were to put in some kind of regulator, I think that would be more comfortable, I think, relative to other jurisdictions where people worry a lot about the misuse by the state of personal information. And I think that's one of the big frontiers here as well, which is what control do we give whom over the data that we're spinning out so rapidly? And actually the trust in AI is much higher in Sweden and the Nordic compared to the rest of yeah. Europe and actually the world as well. Sure. And that's another, I think, strength if, if you sort of, uh, you, you, quite, you, you protect that and you make sure you don't misuse it. Yeah. Right, on that note, Erik, can you elaborate a little bit on what you know about EU regulations in the making on AI? I think the big picture is that we have the regulation we have. So we need, and I was just said, I think, during the speech, we need to adopt kind of the the uh, the AI automation to the, the regulation. Although there is an AI act uh, uh, ongoing, but that will probably take a couple of years uh, until we, we find it uh, in, in Sweden in some kind of legislation. Also, the AI act, as I understand, it's a broad legislation. So it's not only for the financial sector. It's a little bit that GDPR, mm. which maybe is not you know most most positive thing, but it's still it's uh, for for all sectors and it's risk based. So the, you have to kind of pinpoint one part of the financial sector that is, you know, extra need, let's say, of a regulation. And, and so far, the, the, the area that's been mentioned is uh, household credits, hmm. uh, which is, you know, but, but, you know, that might, uh, other parts might be added. Uh, but at this time, that's, that's the, the, the part. And that, that then will be kind of have a specific regulation on transparency, on governance and, and issues like that, which I think is, you know, we'll see the end, end result, but it's a good kind of uh, approach, I think. And also what's been said also in the European system is that, and as I said also in the speech, maybe uh, the values uh, and the priority of uh, personal integrity is, is kind of more pronounced in, in Europe than in other parts of the world. And of course, we can't just then rely on the big tech firms handling this in a European way. We probably need to, to have some tw twist on that one. Right. So I really want to encourage the, the audience to participate in the discussion. So please raise your hand if you, if you have a question you want to ask to the panel. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. The back in the room. Yeah, hi, hi. Uh, uh, I'm uh, doing my PhD study at the Royal Institute of uh, Technology in Stockholm, and uh, our team is uh, focusing on the robot advisor in personal, like financial uh, decision in Nordic countries. So we run a project, and then uh, we found that in Nordic countries, most of the users are more like uh, lay investors, so they are less experienced and uh, low budget as well. I mean, like when you enter the Nordic, uh, the uh, Nordia uh, application, the bank, and there is a, are you new of the invest? Uh, are you new in investing money? Welcome to there is a robot advisor that can provide you. And so, I mean, like uh, different with the Torrance uh, uh, study. So these people are kind of like uh, young age, low um, income, and the thing is, uh, most of these people have a low uh, financial understanding. So there is a risk that then there is two thing that is. Uh, uh, like kind of based on our uh, initial finding of this user test. So first, uh, there, even though the AI is uh, is accurate, they cannot understand or interpret why they got these results uh, generated by this AI. And the second one is um, they they don't have the ability to like uh, comprehend the information, even though the information is uh, transparent, but it's incomprehensible. So I think the financial understanding or literature here is uh, something important because we compare the conventional, like traditional uh, advisor service, but the, the human gonna check or talk with the uh, clients if they understand correctly, but here we lack this kind of uh, Process. So I can ask the panels and the, who should take the responsibility for the basic threshold of financial understanding to enter this AI-based service. Thank you. That's my question. Thank you. 
Well, I, this is, the, I guess, a question about financial literacy and, and to some extent, right? And, and financial literacy we know is, is pretty low. Uh, it's actually higher by the, um, compared to other countries in, in Sweden and the Scandinavian countries, but still, you know, pretty low. I've done some of these uh, kind of tests where you, you should, uh, calculate percentage and, you know, they're pretty basic things and, and people fail. So even though uh, we are better than other countries, we're pretty still low, fairly low. Uh, uh, this need to improve, but I think also you need to be realistic to have uh, every Swede to understand kind of the, the maths and the logic uh, in the financial investing is going to be very, very hard. So therefore, I think it's extremely important to have, if you run the models that they are based on solid, uh, knowledge in your theories and that you're able to explain kind of the and, and that's you know that maybe puts a limit on how advanced models you could have because if they become very advanced how would you be able to explain them for people that don't understand percentage in the first in the, in the first stage so so this is a big challenge but I guess again to, to, to just balance this now they are exposed to salespersons uh, with very uh, kind of uh, problematic incentives, that's much worse. Yeah. So I would uh, definitely prefer AI before you know in, instead of of incentivized uh, salespersons that pushes uh, complex and and very uh, expensive products, and, and we see that. But yeah, I w would like to, add, <laughs> to to comment on that too, because I think in terms of what you mentioned earlier, in terms of distribution of technology, that, that might even be a positive sign that the distribution is, is much broader, because what we've seen in data from the financial market the last few years is that it's actually among high net worth individuals that you've seen the highest transfer to more robo based advice. It's not among low-income people. So, so that will be the next phase when there is more broader adoption. Because there was a misconception in the financial industry that in private banking, people were so reliant on their human advisor. And, and yes, you've proven that you are, but only in combination with right. the model. Mm. So if you're, you rely on the human solidly, that was, those kind of customers tended to leave mm. and a much greater extent. Because high net worth individuals understand that unless I have a model in the, in the background, I mm. will not get the smartest advice. So, yeah. um, but yeah. Eric, so artificial intelligence or machine learning or algorithm do not guarantee, of course, that these incentives are not baked into the algorithm. No, so, exactly. so, yeah, so it's not and home free. No, no, uh, so if, 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 if you turbocharge, uh, uh, yes. kind of, <laughs> I think it was mentioned by Tarun when we, we prepared for it, if you turbocharge the kind of uh, wrong incentives with AI, well, that would be really, really bad, of course. But, right. but the, the, the positive angle is that uh, automation will make it possible to have advice at a very, very low cost to a broad number of people. And that's, yeah, right, so the crucial question is really how do you communicate to consumers or how do con consumers be, be able to distinguish between unbiased and uh, advice that is, uh, has kicked Well, there is regulation right. saying that you, you, you need to basically say that, you know, I am biased and I'm independent. You need to say that to, the, uh, to your client. Right. Well, we find that, that that kind of, how you say that is kind of blurry, uh, <laughs> to say the least. So, you know, I have to say that I'm not really, you know, <laughs> independent, but of course I, I'm really a good guy. So it's, it's going to be very, very hard. And that's why we were, when, when these uh, regulations came into place, we were actually against provisions. To, 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 to make it impossible to have this kind of kickback industry, you know, uh, take away a um, large part of it. And that was introduced in the Netherlands and in the UK, but not so far in Sweden. And now we have some compromised regulation where we actually have a distinguish, di distinguish between independent, purely independent. That's mm -hmm. basically you pay me a fee based on your asset under management or just the fee every every week or every month or every year, and then I will provide you with advice, totally unbiased, and I don't get any kickbacks. And, and some of the robo-advisors we see are actually using that model, and I think that's promising. 
Right. Um, so I, I remember Urban had a question. Yes, uh, thank you. When it comes to kind of regulations and, and regulatory practices and AI, as you said, Eric, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the situation is slightly different in the US when it comes to risk averseness, etc. I think the UK is probably somewhere in between the US and your continental Europe in that sense. Uh, do you see, when it comes to regulations in the future, uh, will AI and machine learning be more like a tool for humans, or will we actually end up in a situation where robots will need, you know, licenses to actually be advisors, etc.? And uh, because when it comes to sustainability, for example, I mean that was not a topic discussed, you know, like when we negotiated MIFID 1 and MIFID 2, for example. So we had to add an additional layer on the existing regulation, and then you got some more specific regulation on that. Do you see a similar, and all three of you, will you see the similar scenario here that we add with, you know, start with some extra layers on what's already there, and then we go into the specifics? Thank you. Um. Happy to, happy to take a shot at that. Um, I, I sort of feel like this conversation is, is, is interesting for, for two reasons. The first is what you don't want to do is you don't want to expose people at the bottom end of the pyramid to get-rich-quick schemes that are basically powered by algorithms. But on the other hand, what you don't want to do is to shut out access to potentially high expected return earning uh, strategies that are pushed by machines that are only available to the top end, and that just increases wealth inequality if you're not careful. Um, I sort of feel like one happy medium, and I think some countries are starting to think about adopting this. Um, certainly this was something I proposed in my policy report on household finance of the Indian government, which was that we have some essential minimum kit of certified product, pre-certified products or types of products that everybody's happy with, that the regulators looked at, and then you say, okay, you can have this, you don't need to, you know, these are white labeled, they're just permissible to everybody. But then you, as you get successively, progressively complicated with the product, uh, then there's some certification that you have to do at every stage to, to, to allow you to access that next level. Now, we have to recognize that in financial markets there's risk. You're never gonna be able to protect people from risk. Um, and in fact, you know, that's where returns come from in, in financial markets. So. So as long as you know, people are comfortable with the consequences of their actions of opting into these services, I think we should be okay with that to a certain extent. But there has to be some essential minimum standard. Now, do I think that there's gonna have to be um, coordinated regulation on this front? Absolutely, because otherwise you just go jurisdiction shopping for the right place. But, but that's, that's as far as, uh, I mean, I think both of you will have views on this. Too. I think the, as I understand it, the AI Act that's is discussed now in Europe is actually thinking of have some kind of CE uh, kind of markup of, of, uh, of uh, some of the models then that are uh, uh, kind of uh, extra risky, let's say, credit assessment. And that's a way of kind of approving yeah. a model. And so I think we're going down that route, but of course, that's going to be extremely complicated to have all models kind of certified, and you know, that will also hamper innovation. So, but in certain areas, in certain aspects of the models, uh, not least around uh, data and around govern governance, I think is extremely important. Okay, I, unfortunately, we only have time for one or two more questions. So I remember in the back of. Yeah. So. Uh, this is my question f uh, regarding the first paper by Professor Ramadurai. I was not fast enough to ask it before. So, you know, the, tradi the traditional model uh, used to be that you had financial advisors and they kind of, you know, gave you a portfolio and then that evolved into there being some kind of CAO and there was a house view and the advisors had some leeway, more or less. Over time, I would say the industry evolved into having less leeway and everybody having to follow the house view. Uh, and that, you know, that house view would probably be based on some model which is more or less exactly the same thing that yeah. the robo-advice model was doing, but, you know, with some, with some additional extras maybe. So, I mean, you've been measuring, I mean, is there really um, algorithm aversion here or is it all about the trust in the financial institution and there are, 
you know, some salespeople or um, advisors that are better at retaining clients and some are worse and it doesn't really have anything to do with the fact that it's a robo engine behind it? So, so, so this is a great question. So it turns out that um, what you really want, the controlled experiment that you really want, is you want the same portfolio that's either run by a robot or by a human, and you want to compare how people react to those two different things. What we have here is an experiment where everybody gets the same robot portfolio, but then they get human beings of various you know, abilities of retaining them. Now, it turns out that if you're clever about it, you can convert one experiment into the other, as long as you have some binary variation in your assignment of human versus not having human. That's still coming. We're, we're still working on that aspect. But we'd like to interpret our results as same person, sorry, same portfolio, robot versus human, um, which would make more sense in the context that you're talking about. It looks a little bit more traditional right now, which is house view and then deferring advisors of different quality. Um, but that's a, that's a very important question that we'll have to, have to address. Um, so not so different now, but can be reparametrized to be exactly the thing that we want, and that's what we're working on. A little bit of a technical answer, but hopefully that, that resolves your doubt. Okay, so before we go to the coffee, I would like to give the opportunity to the panelists for their final remarks, if they have um, something to share. Um, no? That was very open, but I yeah, think it's <laughs> been, been extremely interesting yeah. to listen to other speakers and questions, and, 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 uh, and for sure this is going to be something that is uh, very important for the financial sector. And I definitely agree also, any regulation, supervision, uh, policy actions we take in this area need to be coordinated uh, globally. And trust me, it's not easy yeah. to do no. globally, <laughs> but sure. we need to try, because otherwise uh, this will not come out well. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I can make it more specific because I wanted to, because this will go on the whole day. So this difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning. So within household finance, so do you have, um, how this difference plays uh, a role? So the, do you think, as you presented, machine learning is what we're talking about mostly now? And well, uh, well, I guess it, it, it covers all areas more or less, but what was, where we've seen most of the explosive growth has been within the deep learning area, which is a subset of machine learning. But, right. but, I, but I think one question that I would like to throw in for the ongoing conversation today is that the models, uh, regardless of, of what spectrum within AI that we design today, they tend to be um, not very good in handling new non-standard situations. So there was this interesting uh, study by Bank of England that showed that 35% of all banks actually had huge problems with their AI models during the pandemic. Not surprisingly, obviously, because some of the microeconomic parameters in the models were, were changed dramatically. But I think it gives us a little bit of a, of a a warning signal in terms of that we need to think of the unthinkable and the way we've designed the models is maybe not encompassing that. So how, how do we then you know, prepare for that and make sure that once something happening that we didn't see in the future, what models do need to be redesigned quickly and swiftly in order to not sort of create ripple effects that could be quite dangerous for, for the, the society at large? Right. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, would, I think that's a good point. I mean, we've been talking about household finance, which is obviously super important um, because it deals with directly with household welfare. But, but I think it's true that if we suddenly have a lot of people adopting very similar looking strategies, that we have to little, a little bit think about the consequences in financial markets for what happens when that's the case. I mean, right now we're seeing pretty crazy looking volatility in US financial markets. and. You know, we, we, some of that is partly because of the fact that there's some rule following going on. Um, and we don't really entirely understand the consequences, but that sets us up nicely for both uh, Stefan and Thierry's presentations right. later in the afternoon. So. Right, so thank you, uh, panelists. Okay, and we reconvene. <laughs> <laughs>